Chris. <laughs> A-Hole Productions. Resident Evil. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Nemeseek. And here we are with our spoiler discussion, review, whatever you want to call it, of uh, Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City. I told you my thoughts and kind of went on a rant in my non-spoiler review. Believe it or not, it's a 20-minute video, and uh, there's no spoilers in it. <laughs> like, maybe, I think I mentioned one or two little relationship things between characters, but I don't go into any details. So it's safe to watch if you want to go check that out. Um, and after you see the movie, if you want to come back here and join this discussion in the comments down below, it'll be full of spoilers, so let's dive into it. Um, as you know, I didn't like this movie. Uh, I was... I went in with mediocre expectations. I didn't want to go in too high. I knew I was excited about some of the trailers and some of the interviews I heard and genuinely about some of the cast members. I like Robbie Amell. I like uh, Avon Yogia. So I was very excited to see them. Tom Hopper as Wesker. Like I was excited to see them in these roles. And I think they did the best they probably could. But when you have a director and who is also the writer who doesn't know how to actually write characters, it's hard to give a performance that you know makes an impact and i feel like avon was the closest and probably tom hopper as wesker was the second closest for me um jill was a was actually a close third because um she had a personality uh you know she was kind of rambunctious kind of wild uh wild at heart uh you know had a thing for her superior uh which is you know uh wesker i guess well i guess they don't really say in this if he's the captain of the stars team they don't really say that but it seems like he is because we know that from the game but they don't really i don't think come out and say it um but i but i don't know i so to me i don't know there's so many things about this movie like but but jill was a close third uh, behind wesker as far as like those characters having nuggets of personality traits i can't believe i'm saying this because my favorite two video video game characters of this franchise are chris and claire redfield I can't believe I'm saying that I didn't like either one of them in this movie. They don't do anything. They don't stand out in any way. Claire is like this young girl who like uh, was almost experimented on as a kid uh, when they both, their parents died in a car accident. I honestly thought that was going to tie in somehow that Umbrella, you know, rigged that to happen so that they could get more kids at the orphanage. So they could have more test subjects. Um, they never really get into that. Uh, maybe they will in a future movie who knows but um you know so she's like almost got experimented on but she befriended lisa trevor before the you know birkin showed up to take her away to get experimented on and uh, and then she somehow fought her way off of the scientists and escaped i thought she was going to like escape with the help of lisa trevor but that that wasn't a thing <laughs> lisa trevor by the way a uh, great character in the video games very tragic backstory they tried to do something with that in this movie, but she is barely in it. And her big payoff is that she helps Claire at one point, but she doesn't even realize it's Claire. Uh, she just tells Leon to be quiet because there's a liquor above him. And obviously, like in the video games, the liquors are blind. So if you make a noise, they jump down on you. Like one of the liquors are like that, like a thing from Resident Evil 5. So, um, and I think they did that in the Resident Evil 2 remake too with the liquors. So they can't see you. They, they have brains for heads, right? So they can't see you. So they go off of like whatever they can hear, vibrations or something. So Leon is like, she tells him to shush and he's like, guys, get over here. And because he makes that noise, the liquor, you know, descends on them and, and tries to kill them. And then Lisa fights the liquor and kills the liquor for them uh, and then realizes it's Claire. So I'm like, so why did she help them? If You know, I don't know. Like, you could have had a, I don't know. I mean, if you could have had a scene where an RPD member maybe tried to help Lisa once, and that's why she helped them because she saw Leon's outfit, but they don't, and there's nothing. Like, there's the thing, things just happen with no like real rhyme or reason. Like, if she would have recognized Claire first, and if it was her telling Claire to shish instead of Leon, um, then that could have made more sense. But then after she saves them, she looks at Claire and goes, Claire? You know, and you're like, what <laughs> like what um the opening scene where it's like seven minutes or so or five minutes of uh, of the orphanage and uh claire's sneaking around at night and she meets Lisa trevor like that scene goes on way too long um 
especially considering I thought, okay, it's it's long because that's going to have a big payoff. Claire couldn't save Lisa. So maybe at the end, Lisa's going to come in and save Claire or something and save Sherry or something. They're going to see another little girl in trouble and they're going to intervene against the G-Monster or something. Nope. Like literally Lisa Trevor, right before the third act starts, shows Claire where the secret elevator is in the orphanage that leads to the Arclay Mountains. <laughs> so like they're in the heart of downtown with the orphanage. And there's apparently a tunnel that you can walk that like brings you all the way to the Arclay Mountains. Uh, I guess you could say the tram maybe stops and takes you there, but they don't really establish that. Uh, they just show uh, Claire and Leon take an elevator down and then they take another staircase down. And I, But Wesker, like, I don't know. This is going to sound like nonsense if you haven't seen the movie, but Wesker is handing, handed a Palm Pilot, much like Trent did to Jill in the novel. So someone handed uh, Wesker a Palm Pilot. They put it in his locker and they sent him a page on his pager, <laughs> which I'm sure like some young kid is probably going to watch this movie and go, what the hell is that thing? Uh, it was a, like a, a text messenger. And it's like, yeah, no, it was a pager. So he gets this page that says, go check your locker. Raccoon City is going to be destroyed at 6 a.m. Uh, take this to the mansion and find a secret passage there to like, I don't know, uh, or, or fi yeah, find the secret passage to the lab of Birkin and uh, in the nest or whatever. But I'm like, I'm so confused because like, so if you know the geography of the video games, this movie makes no sense <laughs> geography wise because the they show the that you have to take a helicopter to get to the Arclay Mountains to the Spencer Mansion, much like in the video games. So because it's way far outside of town, uh, it's in another jurisdiction, even like Arclay jurisdiction, right outside of Raccoon City. So they got to take a helicopter to get there. Then you have the police department and the orphanage are in downtown, very far away. So there's no way there's a tunnel that like like Wesker is in the mansion and just runs down this super long tunnel. And we're led to believe that it kind of brings you back almost to underneath the police department where the nest is in the video games. But the movie doesn't establish like the Paul Anderson movies. Not I don't want to give those movies credit, but one thing they did was there was at least 3D maps that would pop up that would show like where where things are and where the characters are in you know location wise like in, in the set of the world that they're in this movie doesn't have any of that and instead they just have blank black screen pop up with white text that say 2 a.m 3 a.m 4 55 a.m you know, stuff like that so you know that this is all happening in one night um and it's such a cluster and this town like they they open up by saying that umbrella corporation was working on something in this town and then they just up and left one day to go find a new town to be a part of I think there's an Easter egg in this of where that new town is, which is a rev reference to Resident Evil 6. Birkin is literally wearing a t-shirt that says Tall Oaks. Tall Oaks is a city in Resident Evil 6 where the next outbreak happens, the next Raccoon City outbreak. If you don't count Sheena Island and all the other places like Rockford Island and all that stuff. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so he has a Tall Oaks shirt on. I'm like, okay, so maybe Umbrella went there. They said they took all their top tier scientists and only left people that were too poor to go. Um, a couple police members uh, who didn't get transferred and uh, and a few scientists. And that's so that's why there's it's a small town with very few people in it and very few zombies in it and stuff. But then when they get to the mansion, it's like overrun by zombies. Like every room they go in has like 10 zombies in it. So there's like all these things in the movie that are inconsistent, aren't done well, aren't explained well enough. They basically rely on you to know the games intimately to piece together things that the movie is terrible at piecing together itself. And then when you do try to piece it together based on uh, you know knowledge of the video games, it doesn't make sense because the movie changes enough to where your no prizes that you're winning for explaining how things are happening don't add up to what the movie is showing you and explaining to you. My friend, I saw this movie with my friend Nate, who is not a Resident Evil fan. He doesn't know anything about Resident Evil except maybe a, a couple of the previous movies he saw. But in this, he was like asking me questions like, why did this happen? Why did that happen? And there were some things I actually explained. I'm, I'm pretty observant when I watch movies and I try to listen to everything. I only got the one ear and I try to use it, you know, very well to listen to everything that's said. And so, and I try to process it. And that's why I'm recording these tonight because I have short-term memory loss. So I'll for, probably forget this movie. Even without short-term memory loss, I feel like I'm going to forget this movie because it's, it's boring. 
But there are lines that, that were said in it that I'm like telling Nate, I'm like, well, they kind of explain that by this. And this line kind of implies that. But again, some of the lines just imply things like Birkin. My friend Nate was asking about Birkin. He's like, Bir like, so there's a scene where, so Leon's a big idiot in this movie. <laughs> like he's a completely oblivious. He's not aware. The backstory they give him is that his dad is rich and that Leon was a cop in another town and accidentally shot his partner in the, in the ass basically. And then had to get transferred, but no one would take him. And only because his dad is like some high level, you know, politician or executive or something somewhere, he pulled some strings to get Leon sent to Raccoon City. Um, and the only reason I think he was approved to get sent to Raccoon City was because there was, they have a skeleton police force. They have the Bravo team, which is literally Enrico Marini and Kevin Dooley and their police officers. They're not even SWAT members or STARS members. They're just police officers. And they get a call about a, um, a murder or a dead body that showed up outside the Spencer mansion. So they decide to take their squad car up there to investigate. And then for whatever reason, the police chief of the, the siren goes off warning them that something happened, some kind of chemical spill or danger, even though the town has slowly been infected. So after umbrella left, this is the story they tell in the beginning in text, uh, the, the umbrella left raccoon city to go set up shop at a new city I'm thinking Tall Oaks, possibly, or Rockford Island or somewhere. Uh, I hope they never make another one of these movies, to be honest with you. Because this movie is all Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3, all in one, but without any of the cool stuff. No Mr. X, no Tyrant, no Nemesis. Um, you kind of get the G-Monster, kind of, but it's pretty laughable and pretty bad. Not just visually, but also the execution of the emotion they're trying to add to the, that transformation in that scene. So Umbrella's gone and you just have like a waitress named Luis at the diner. You have like a couple people. There's some neighbors to Chris Redfield that are still in town, like a mom and her kid who are infected and their hair is falling out. So basically the water has been contaminated. Umbrella left and they knew this was going to happen. So they plan on just blowing the city up. There's a bunch of, you know, uh, the nest underneath uh, the city. There's the uh, Arclay Mountains, the Spencer Mansion. All of these places are rigged to explode. So they're not sending in a nuke like they did in the previous movies and in the video games. They can just self-destruct everything and erase all evidence of everything, um, which is infuriating because there's a scene where literally Claire finds physical evidence to prove what Umbrella is doing. And she doesn't keep it or tuck it and find a backpack, put it in there and wear it like that was something they did in the novels where like Leon and uh, I think Claire or Jill in the first novel, too. She was gathering stuff like notes and stuff and tucking them in her outfit uh so that way they would have some kind of evidence if they survived and i'm like that's a smart idea like you know, claire is all about trying to expose the truth and really she doesn't do anything to try to expose the truth she just comes in to town and she's like doesn't listen to anybody and they try to give her feedback or talk to her and she's not even paying attention and she's just like screw you i know what i'm doing i know what i'm here for and she's just she's i don't know i don't like claire's not good in this the, the lady who plays her does not do a good job and the character is is not a character. She literally just shows up to boss the men around for a little bit. And whereas I'm okay with that on some level, like Jill's kind of antagonistic like that around the boys, but she is a SWAT member that works with the boys. Claire is like a runaway who had to like fend for herself. So she probably dealt with creepy guys. Like she hitchhikes into Raccoon City in this movie and the guy tries to grab her leg. So she, she obviously knows how to defend herself and I get that, but it completely strips her of a personality. So even if she was just a hard edged, I've been through it all and seen through it all. And her emotional arc is that she learns to open up and feel something at the end. That would be something. But at the end, she kind of leans her head on Chris and says something a little emotional, but it's, it's, it doesn't, you don't feel the impact of it because immediately afterwards they got you know, stupid monsters showing up and stuff and, uh, and bad dialogue. I mean, everyone in this movie says fuck a thousand times. Um, I know this movie's rated R and I'm not like Mr. Like, uh, don't say swear words all the time, but everyone in this is, is bad. And my friend Nate actually came up with a good idea because everyone swears so much. He's like, if the water's contaminated and, and they, they throw like a line and they say, well, the reason the stars and the police aren't contaminated is because they got a booster shot. Uh, you know, like a, a couple months ago, which is basically they don't get infected by what's in the water. So everyone else in town has been slowly infected by the water. Their eyes are bleeding. Their hair is falling out. Lumps of skin are coming off and stuff. 
that's those are the symptoms of the video game. So I give them props for for getting that stuff right and paying attention to that kind of detail. But it's um so but you don't get to know enough of the characters to feel for them when you start seeing them fall apart. And then when they do start falling apart, it's really quick. And then they're zombies, and then you they're moving on with the story because they have so many characters. They're like we got to juggle all this, but it's like man, this is the prime example of having too many characters and none of them feeling like actual characters. Like if they would have just focused on the first video game, we could have got the lore of the Spencer mansion. We probably could have even got a scene with Oswald E. Spencer in it. The twist with Wesker would have had more impact. That's this movie like Wesker reveals that he, he got the Palm pilot put in his locker. We find out from who in the post credit scene, um, which I'll save for the end in case you don't want to know what that is. But he, and if you don't want to know what it is now, I'll get to it eventually though. But he gets his Palm Pilot. It tells him all the puzzles in the mansion. He get, When they get to the mansion, he's solving the piano puzzle. He goes down that tunnel, like I said, runs forever. Um, and he tells Jill, like, I'm sorry, it's just for money. Like, I want to get out of this town. I, I hate this place, this small town that with our dead end lives. And Jill takes it personally because they imply many times in the movie or a couple times, I should say, that they're uh, they're together, that they're sleeping together, and that there's a, a relationship there. They never show it. They don't ever kiss. They don't ever hold hands. They don't do anything intimate or nothing like that. They just imply it a couple times, and one character says, oh, yeah, she clearly has a thing for the big guy. But you don't know how deep that thing is, so when she acts hurt at the end by Wesker saying, look, I was, yes, I was going to leave you guys here in the mansion and just go down this hallway, find Birkin's sample, take it, and, and leave you know and just and sell it to somebody for like a billion dollars he's like it's not personal and and he's like but you can come with me like if you want he's like telling jill like come with me and she's like no and she goes back to like save chris and stuff and you can tell chris has a crush on her because someone says it not because he really acts it so much except for one scene where they split up and she goes with wesker and he's kind of like okay i wish she was she would have stuck with me but okay, I'll take Richard instead. That was the only time you really get a sense that he cared about, uh, you know, Jill. Claire says, oh, you're still pining over Jill. But that's it. She just says it. Like, it's not shown. And that's the thing is, like, everyone's backstory is told and not shown. Leon, did he really shoot his partner in the butt and get saved by his dad? I don't know. That's what a character said randomly to him. Um, Oswald e. Spencer, he created an umbrella and he lived in that house until he died. Okay, that's not his actual story from the video game, but that's the story they're going with for the movie. Fine, but you hear that from Chief Irons, and it's said as a joke so he can tell Leon to get out of the room. So there's like all these things like that in it where you just get like two sentence explanations of each character, and then nothing else to the rest of the movie adds on to that or makes them a character. I think the only thing is Leon is like he's inept through the first half of the movie, and then finally his his nuts drop and he shoots a zombie and kills him but even still he feels cool doing it like he's like all right i did it and i'm this is me i'm doing i'm gonna get my shit together like claire told me to and then he turns to claire and she goes are you finished you know and you're like really like let the guy have his moment <laughs> like she's so bitchy <laughs> like honestly and like not in a in a like kind of charming or cool way she's just flat and boring and insulting you know and I guess you could say that's her character because she grew up tough in, you know, and, and had it fend for herself all these years. Okay, that's fine. But again, we didn't see any of that. It's just all said. So this is a prime example, like where he had so much stuff he wanted to do with these characters, Johannes Roberts, when he was writing this story, that it's one of those cases where a lot of it's probably in his head and not a lot of it made it to the page. And then it probably came down to filming. Like they were like, okay, we can't film some of this stuff. So, uh, so we can't show some of these things that are essential to understanding these characters and where they might end up at the end of the movie. But no one really has an arc in this. Like Leon's nuts drop, and he is the one with the rocket launcher, I guess, to shoot the G monster at the end. But he's the one with the least connection to that monster. Uh, when they get to the final group of people, it's Leon, Jill, you know, Claire, and Chris, and Sherry, and they're all on the tram trying to leave. And they try to come up with some backstory where after Claire left when she was a kid from the orphanage, Chris became the good son and he uh, warmed up to Birkin and Birkin kind of raised him as a son. 
and he helped him get a job at, or get, get get into the academy using Umbrella's connections and get him uh, to be on the Stars members, which is like a special forces team. So this town has like three cops, a police chief, a new rookie, and like five SWAT members, and like that's all this town has for police. Um, but I didn't mind that so much because they came up with a story reason for it, at least, which was everyone cleared out of town and the only people left were the few people that were too poor to leave or the few cops that couldn't get transfers, which was like the stars team and everybody. So, um, so yeah, I don't know this. So, and Brad Vickers is there obviously as the pilot, but he literally just shows up to fly them all in and then he gets killed. <laughs> so everyone's just there to serve a purpose one small thing until they get killed and that reminds me a lot of the previous resident evil movies which uh that's what they would do here's leon he's going to show up and he's going to do this one thing that's very you know kind of leon-esque and then he's going to do nothing else like leon and then at the end of the movie he's going to like try to flirt with ada and you know whatever and that's that's what made those movies terrible and this movie does that but almost in every scene because you have those you have chris and jill and claire in every scene and you're like do something with them do something with them and they don't and this director like i said this feels like a fanboy film he's like i'm going to throw in all my favorite characters from the games i'm going to combine the first two games together and the third game kind of too and make homages to uh resident evil 6 and uh code veronica at the same time it's like it's fanboy the movie that's that's what it is and and not in a good way not in a flattering way not in a way that i think represents the resident evil franchise well on any level uh, I've always said, you don't need to make these Oscar winners, but they do deserve better than what they've gotten. And I'm including this movie now. This movie is not a for-the-fans movie. Like, I, that was the big thing they kept saying in interviews, and I fell for it, man. I fell for it big time, because I saw the sets, I saw the, the actors they got in the costumes, and I'm like, this is, it's way better and closer to Resident Evil than the previous movies are. Is this worse than the Miljovic movies. Yeah, it's worse than some of them, in my opinion. And the only reason I say that is I'm very critical of those movies, and they are soulless, hack, corporate, thrown-together movies made by a bunch of amateurs, I feel, and not talented people, in my opinion. But there are scenes in those movies, as much as I hate them, you can remember them. I hate the laser hallway. It's a ripoff of Cube, and it's in four of those stupid movies, but you remember it. I hate the idea of the Red Queen and all that stuff and the Alice in Wonderland references, but you remember it. This movie doesn't have anything like that, in my opinion. It doesn't have anything that adds a, a, a sense of flavor to it. It's just this soulless copy of moments from the game and uh, with, with little context to it or no context in some cases, and then just reimagining all the characters, which, I, again, I say that's fine, you can do that, but then don't paint it and market it to look like it's a just a great copy of the games. That was the frustrating part. It's like, dude, either do like a full-on copy, um, which I don't know why you would do because then you could just go play the games and that's fine. But I thought that's why he blended the two stories in. So there would be some twist you wouldn't see coming. I'm telling you, if you played the two games, first two games, there is nothing surprising in this movie other than the fact that kind of Wesker is not a villain. Wesker does kind of, he betrays a team for money, but when he's really putting a, ch a chance to shoot people to prove he's a villain, video game Wesker, you saw him at the end of that movie, or the end of the first video game, he shoots Rebecca, no problem, she's a kid, he doesn't care, boom, Rebecca, down, or boom, Barry, down, boom, Jill, down, whatever, he does not care, uh, he, he is a bad guy, he is a villain, in this movie, he has a chance to shoot Birkin, uh, and he does, and he doesn't want to. And he's like, man, why did you do that? You shot me. And so he had to shoot Birkin back as like a self-defense. Then Birkin injects himself. Then Annette picks up the gun. He's like, ma'am, don't, don't make me do this. Please don't make me do this. She picks up the gun, turns around, and he shoots Annette and kills her. Then he asks, he tells Sherry, come on out, come out, kid. He reveals after he gets shot by Jill, uh, you know, and that's the other thing. He gets shot by Jill, and then he's like, damn it, Jill, you and your gun. And then she like laughs and she goes, it's okay, we can still get you out of here. And he's like, no, but I'm going to save you. Take my Palm Pilot, get out of here. And he goes, kid, he looks over at Sherry and he's like, I wasn't going to kill you, kid. I, I promise you. He's like, I'm, I'm, I wasn't going to do it. That to me already shows he's not uh, the same Wesker as the video game, which again, on some level, I don't mind too much, but the what they do, the payoff of it is not good. 
there is a post credit scene. Uh, the post credits. Oh, it's not at the end of the credits. It's midway. So I will. I'm going to reveal that now. So if you don't want that spoiler, um, you know, turn away or turn off the episode. But uh, there is a mid credit scene where they re reimagine the the body bag sitting up in the morgue from the Resident Evil One remake video game. You know, right when you start the game, you see the body bag shuffle and get up, and it's a zombie, and then someone shoots it in the head, and it drops back down. They recreate that with Wesker crawling out of the zombie bag because he gets shot and killed, but his body, I guess, was retrieved before the detonation went off, um, which is cutting it close. So I was like, who saved him? Who? What's going on? Well, he gets up and he, and he can't see. He's like, oh, my eyes, my eyes. And then Ada walks in. So this is why we haven't seen her in any of the trailers or anything, because she's literally only in the post credit scene, which Sony normally gives those scenes away. So I'm surprised they didn't in this case. But if you give the scene away, you're going to give away the Wesker twist as well. So um, even more so. So Wesker's like, I can't see, I can't see. She's like, yeah, it's a side effect. You've been injected with something and uh, and your body's reacting differently to it. Um, but don't worry that you're you're the first of many. There's going to be more coming. And I'm like, what does that mean? Like, does that mean other? So, so already they're setting up in this world that death, there's no stakes to dying. You can die and come back perfectly normal like Wesker is. You don't see his eyes. I think the one time he blinks, they look a little red. But of course, she gives him sunglasses to put on which you're like, I made me roll my eyes. I'm like, of course, because I guessed it. I, I didn't say it in any of my episodes because I thought I was going to be right. I was like, the post credit scene is going to be Wesker mutated and he's going to put on sunglasses. And that's exactly what the post credit scene was. Only the sunglasses were handed to him by Ada. And she's working for some company that is uh, recruiting people to help take down Umbrella. But they're clearly creating superhumans of their own, so they're probably not good people either. And they're trying to set up a, a potential sequel. But this movie literally covers the the mansion, the RPD, and the destruction of Raccoon City without a tyrant, without a Mr. X, and without a nemesis. So I honestly don't know what the second one would be. I guess they would just do Resident Evil 6, like a, a hybrid of Resident Evil 5 and 6 would probably make sense. Or do a Code Veronica, maybe, since they set up the Ashford twins in this one. But who cares? Like, I don't want to see any more movies in this universe, honestly. That's how much I didn't like this one. And I, I hate saying that because I went into this very optimistic and with high hopes. But this movie, like this review here where I'm just ranting, it's all over the place. Like, I, me and the movie just made my head melt. Uh, I got out of that and I was asking my friend, I'm like, tell me what you thought and ask me questions that didn't make sense to you. And he would, and I would answer a couple things. Like, he said, oh, well... Why did he's like, I hate when characters yo yo, you know, back and forth. Like Birkin wanted to, like, the, you know, or Birkin, um, Chief Irons wanted to leave the police station and get out of town. And then he decided to have a change of heart and go back and be heroic and shoot the zombie dog and save people. And I'm like, well, that's not what happened. <laughs> what happened was that Irons tried to leave the town, but Hunk and all of his men were on the outskirts of town, making sure no one left and they were shooting people, much like uh, Resident Evil Apocalypse did. Um, and then when I saw Hunk, I thought he was going to break into the lab and steal Birkin's stuff. Why is Birkin still there? I don't know. They say he's, he says he kind of implies that he's working on the G-Virus, which he does. They show the G-Virus. Um, but uh, but when the alarm goes off for everyone to evacuate town, I'm like, what? They, someone calls Birkin and says, hey, you know, get to a checkpoint. We'll get you out. So I guess that kind of answers that. But because me and my friend were wondering, we're like, why would they leave someone as important as him behind but I, he maybe just wanted to stay behind to continue his work on the G-Virus. And he had some woman laying on a table ripped open. And she kind of looked a little bit like Lisa Trevor. So maybe it was Lisa's mom or just another kid from the orphanage, maybe. But he was working on the G-Virus. And he has these six samples. He gets shot by Wesker and he injects himself and then turns himself into the G-Monster. And at the end, he's getting into a fight with Chris. And he's like, Chris, you know, you were the good son. I gave you everything. And like, what, are you going to kill me now? And he's like mutating and, and having this like over the top cheesy dialogue. And he's they're, they're trying to give you this emotion like, oh, my God, Chris has to kill his surrogate father. Oh, my God, that's so traumatic and, and dramatic and traumatic. But it's like, no, it's not. Because we heard that Chris was raised by him through dialogue, through like two lines of dialogue that Chris says to, to Claire near the beginning of the movie. That's it. Like, it's it's. You're like, what? That doesn't, there's no, you can't earn an emotion if you don't show it, right? So they show a couple flashbacks of Claire 
you know, escaping the um, orphanage, why not show a couple flashbacks of a uh, young Chris, you know, growing up and, and having a connection to Birkin, you know, I don't know. And then Birkin actually has a daughter who he kind of neglects to it to an extent. Um, but uh, I don't know. And Sherry just, she's just a little girl who screams. That's it. She doesn't have a personality at all in the video games. She's very no nonsense. She's kind of tough for a little kid. She's brave. Um, she's kind of like Newt from uh, Aliens. And I understand why they didn't want to rip off that because they've already done that in a couple of Resident Evil movies. But she literally has no personality. She is just a little girl that is following them at the end of the movie, <laughs> like up to the end of the movie and then out, uh, you know, into the end of the movie. So for me, like uh, watching this, I was like, man, everyone's physically here. We have the gang all here. But the few that need to act a certain way aren't acting that way. Um, and I understand you want to add stuff to their personality, but add stuff. Don't replace, right? Um, and that's what this movie, I think, does uh, egregiously, is that it replaces personalities that the characters do have in the games. Because you can say, go back and look at Resident Evil 1 and say, well, Chris is kind of a blank slate because he needs to be so the player can imprint themselves on the Chris. So when they play as him, they feel the fear that Chris is supposed to be feeling. Right, but there's like a hundred games out now, and we have an actual personality for Chris based on those games. So you actually can give Chris a personality based on attributes he has in the video games, um, and they don't do that in this movie at all. Uh, they just make up their own thing, and it doesn't even, and it only lasts for like a scene, and then after that they stop acting like characters, and they just become people who just shoot at monsters until the end of the movie. And uh, and I know that's sure that's accurate to the game uh to to an extent but uh the, i don't know there's more connection i feel to the characters of the game because at least you're playing it and that's what i feel like i feel like this guy johannes roberts was like oh we'll do this in the movie because the game does it but the game can get away with that because you are playing the game and you are imprinting your fears and personality onto the characters in the movie you have to add that stuff and it's clear he did try in the first act but once you get past all of the, you know, once they set up all the characters, like the first 20 minutes, I'm like, okay, they're setting up the characters and everyone has somewhat of a personality. They have a, a, a role that, okay, you're the funny one and you're kind of the, 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 you know, the aggressive one and whatever. I get it. Okay, sure. But then after that, they don't act like that at all. They just become a bunch of people firing weapons at monsters and they almost never run out of bullets. Or if they do, there's another gun they can pick up right away to finish the job. So you don't really get a sense of fear. And there's like three times where Chris gets overrun by zombies and they're grabbing at him and he gets away from them. He just pushes them off and gets away. And I'm like, what? There's no like knife to the head like in the first video game or a grenade in the mouth that blows one's head up and pushes a couple other ones back. Nothing cool like that at all. Like, come on, nothing creative or interesting or even pulled from the video games. It's just Chris just goes, eh, and then gets away. <laughs> like... Uh, the this this movie is 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 a mess um this review is a mess because the movie scrambled my brain i i wanted to root for this movie i did root for this movie actually and if you watch my other videos i'm very optimistic i really defended this movie at times i genuinely thought the trailers looked interesting and good and even though there was moments in the trailers i'm like okay i'm critical of that i'm critical of that but if they make up a small part of the movie and the rest of the stuff that i am liking is the majority of the movie I'll be in good hands. But the one thing I was worried about more than anything going into this was how do you combine the stories of the first game and the second game together? And then when I watched it, I'm like, well, the third game's in here too, kind of, just without Nemesis. So the ticking time clock of the city's going to blow up, that's felt throughout most of the movie from the second act onward. So that's from Resident Evil 3. So to me, I'm like, you put all that in this, it doesn't work. It does not work. The way he did it doesn't work. The way Johannes Roberts constructed this story trying to make you know the chris and claire thing being from the orphanage i don't have a problem with that we don't know that much you know that much about them from the video games so you want to do that and make that their reasoning for things fine but then after they set that up they, like i said they try to force earn emotions towards the end lisa trevor that was an emotional thing in the opening of the movie so i thought it was going to be there at the end of the movie but it wasn't because like at, like end of the second act she gives claire the keys to the secret room and then shows her a, a painting on the wall and shows that there's a secret lock there. And so Claire uses the video game keys for the police department in the orphanage. <laughs> I, the whole time I'm sitting there going, in the police department, there is a secret tunnel 
that leads to the nest. Uh, Bur you know, Birkin, uh, you know, knows about it, but obviously Irons does too. So they imply in the movie that Irons works for Umbrella and that he turns a blind eye to their stuff because Leon, like I said earlier, he's inept. He's sitting at the police department, uh, he, like uh, he's sitting at the, the front desk and he's uh, in a truck, the, the gas truck that brought Claire into town, it tips over and crashes and explodes right in front of him. And he's asleep, like listening to music, you know, like listening to the cardigans or something, um, which uh, which I think is the song is called My Favorite Game, which I'm like, that's a little on the nose. Um, but anyway, he's listening to a song, like a pop song, and the truck crashes and then the, the truck driver stumbles in on fire and Iron just comes down and shoots it. And they and Leon gets up and the gunshot wakes him up, but not the the exploding truck in the front. And Leon jumps up and he's like, "Well, what is it?" And he goes, "He's like, uh, shut the door. There's going to be more of them." So it's like, okay, so that implies that Irons knows about zombies and knows about the experiments they're doing, and he's probably turned a blind eye. But this Irons is not a creepy, uh, you know, um, young woman stalker who like stuffs people. He's not that intense in this movie. He's just a, a, a police chief that i think they said in one of the interviews he's on the verge of retiring as soon as like in a couple weeks he's going to be retired they never mention that in the movie at all um he never says look guys this is like yeah leon it's your first day but it's like my last week here you know and uh, and you guys will be someone else's problem next week he never says anything like that um so you don't really if i didn't want read that interview i wouldn't have known that about the character and that's the frustrating part there's stuff that i've read in interviews that are just not on the screen. And I don't know if it was something they filmed and just got cut, but if so, whatever they cut out, if it was that important to these characters, they should have kept it in, even if it made it a two hour movie. But clearly they knew that this was not a very good movie. It probably ran too long for test audiences. So they cut out some useful stuff and try to make it, you know, an hour and 45 minutes so it can play a little bit more often in theaters to try to make more money. And they cut it down to something that, is just boring and, and lacks character in the second and third act. The opening sets up the characters well enough to where you think they're going to build off stuff, and then you don't. I actually think the first act is like Force Awakens, uh, where it's like, oh, I know what all these things are, and it's setting everything up, and okay, cool. And then the second act and the third act are The Last Jedi and uh, whatever the third one was called. I can't even remember. Uh, or maybe the third one was called Last Jedi. I can't even remember those movies. Uh, Rise of Skywalker, that's what it was. So it reminded me of that, where it just... Oh, look at the potential and then nothing do nothing with it and that's how i felt when i as this movie kept going so yeah this is my long you know i am sure i didn't cover every single thing i'm sure and i know i'm missing stuff but i've, I've honestly this movie's already seeping out of my head it's it was boring there were times where i just my jaw was just hanging open like like what like what are they doing here like this is these moments with these characters aren't good. This dialogue is bad. Everybody says the F-bomb a thousand times. And like I said, my friend Nate came up with a good idea. I think I started on this earlier and I forgot because I'm all over the place. He said the booster shot thing was a dumb idea to make the police or the SWAT, the stars members. Uh, why give them, why, why just throw that line in? Oh, you got booster shots. That's why you're not infected from the stuff that's in the water. But if you get bit by a zombie or you could turn, you know, but you're all kind of immune to the basic infection. Um, because Claire's trying to figure out, okay, he drinks water. Why isn't my brother infected? And that's what they reveal. He got a booster shot. Oh, yeah. So I just want to add this in because I think I mentioned it like three times and I didn't actually make my point, which was my friend Nate came up with an idea of why the STARS members weren't infected. He said, why don't you make them all drunks? You know, like make it just to where like Chris's apartment just has alcohol everywhere, like bo empty bottles. He's has abandonment issues maybe. He you know found out his sister may be coming back into town. He's drinking even more. Everyone on the stars team, maybe they're just like, yeah, I don't, we don't drink the water in this town. Like, do something fun like that because I don't know, it's it's something character based, it's something more interesting than just saying, oh, you all got booster shots. So uh, yeah, I just I, I feel like I brought that up three or four times and it, it never like I never actually said what my friend Nate said. So that was one of the things he said, and I, I thought that was great. I thought that was a good idea, and uh, I said, yeah, that would have added something to it, you know, just something memorable, something to where it's just like they're they go instead of going to the diner every night, they go to a bar every night and just get drunk, 
and that's why they've never had any of the water or something. So uh, and they just drink bottled beer all the time or something. So I was like, yeah, that's something. I mean, granted, you can't drink bottled beer all the time, <laughs> you know, so that might only work for like one or two characters, but that could have been a story arc in and of itself or something. So I don't know. I just thought that was funny and I wanted to, you know, splice that in real quick. Ben Bertolucci shows up. He's on the tapes of Claire's in the beginning and then he shows up and he's actually right in the same vicinity as Claire, but he dies before Claire can get to him. Um, he, he's interacting with Leon instead. And I'm like, but it's one of those things where I talk about when they remade Resident Evil 3, the video game, they put Carlos in the police department. And I'm like, why? He doesn't have any attachment to the police department. So there's no emotional feelings you'll get from the character being in there. You got to put Jill in the police department because then she can walk by a desk and go, oh, this was so-and-so's desk. And this was David's desk. This was uh, Kenneth, Kenneth uh, uh, Branagh's desk or whatever, or Marvin Branagh's desk. I always confuse the two because uh, Kenneth Branagh is a famous actor and director. But Marvin Branagh, like, it, that's his desk. You know, they could have said all, that's what you want. You want, you know, those moments where there's an impact, an emotional impact. This movie does that, like what the remake of Resident Evil 3 did. They kept, they put Carlos in the police department. That's what they would do here. They had Leon see, uh, you know, Ben Bertolucci in the jail cell because the game did that. I understand. But Leon doesn't know who Ben is. He should have had Claire come down there. She would have got him out. Maybe he would have lived. Uh, he dies in the dumbest way. He steals Leon's gun, just making Leon even more inept. And there's this guy turning into a zombie right next to him and he doesn't shoot him. He, he just sits there and waits for the gate to open and then just allows himself to get bit before he can reveal, you know, even more exposition. He just sets, he goes, do you know what the T virus is or the G virus? And then he gets bit and you're like, okay. So he just set that up, one random line and uh, and there's no payoff to it or no nothing. So there's, there's a lot of like Carlos in the police department is what I call it, scenes in this movie where there's people interacting with other characters that you're like, but why? Like, why have them interact? <laughs> like, like uh, you need this, to, like Leon showing up with the rocket launcher at the end uh, and killing Birkin. It's like, but why Leon? Like, I get his arc was he needed to, you know, nut up and do something and be heroic, I guess, but he had no connection to Birkin. Uh, so I don't know. This, this movie's just not good. Uh, Johannes Roberts, uh, you're, in my opinion, um, I don't know, maybe you wrote a great script, uh, to be fair, right? Like, maybe you wrote a decent script and you got notes on it, and then it had to be filmed, and some things couldn't be filmed for whatever reason during the pandemic, and then maybe the some someone corporate person came in and made you cut things out, or they just didn't have the money to finish the effects on certain scenes, so those got cut out because they couldn't finish the movie on time if they left it in. There's a million reasons why movies end up like this, but I think at the end of it, it doesn't matter ultimately how much they add, unless they add another hour into this film, I don't see it being any better, uh, honestly, than what we got. Uh, this, uh, uh, it's a story that is devoid of character, um, and it has bad, really bad pacing. Um, is not a very flattering um, tribute to Assault on Precinct Thirteen in any way. I don't feel, uh, and honestly, I get tired of hearing these filmmakers say, "I wanted to do this." Like, I want, oh, I'm doing Resident Evil. I wanted to do a John Carpenter movie with zombies, or I want to do. Omega Man with zombies. I'm getting tired of hearing that, honestly. Um, I don't want people like that to be hired for these movies anymore. We're two for two now in, in the territory of bad. Um, I want someone who doesn't know the property that well, but understands how to string together a scene. Because uh, the camera work in this is not bad. The music's not great, uh, but the camera work is not bad. So there's some talent there. There's not a bunch of crappy jump cuts, which is great. I like that too, but that's it. I mean, it's only, the only compliments I can really give this movie. And the fact that Ivan Yogia and Tom Hopper and um, and um, uh, uh, Hannah Hannah Kanan, who plays Jill, they all tried. They tried to do something with their character and add something. Um, everyone else was just like, you know, stoic white guy, stoic white chick. You know, like that's who they were. So, uh, so for me, this movie, it gets a one and a half out of five stars. I think I mentioned that in my, my previous one, but, uh, yeah, one and a half. Uh, I don't know if I'll want to watch this again. Maybe if they release it with a commentary track, maybe I'll wait till it goes on bargain bin and buy it for five bucks and listen to the commentary track because I'm 
a part of me is curious of why decisions were made for this movie and how little Johannes Roberts really doesn't understand the source material, in my opinion. But then the other part of me doesn't ever want to contribute to this movie financially again because that's how much I, I was upset by it. After six horrible Mili Jovovich movies, I guess the first one's okay, and probably a lot of people will say that. And there's parts of two through four, maybe, that have okay moments. But after that, I really was just hoping, I'm like, the bar is not high. You don't have to try too hard to do better than those six movies, in my opinion. And somehow, Johannes Roberts couldn't even do that. That, to me, shows incompetence and misunderstanding of the source material on a level unprecedented. Like, I just didn't think possible. Um, at this point, I would rather Uva Bowl make a Resident Evil movie where he just edits in shots in the game or something. Like, I don't know. I, I this We need to find someone who's not a fan of the material. I have... This is the 25th anniversary of Resident Evil. Village was a pretty good game. I didn't like it as much as 7, though. Um, but it had a pretty decent ending, to be honest with you. I thought the ending was pretty good. But uh, the Infinite Darkness was garbage, I thought. Terrible, worst CG animated thing that they've done. This is not a good movie, in my opinion. And now they have that Wesker show for Netflix that I don't think is going to be good either. Wouldn't that be a surprise if that turned out to be good? <laughs> like, that that would shock me. But for a 25th anniversary, um, this was a this was a bust of a year. Uh, for this franchise in my opinion um and i don't think this movie is gonna there may be fan, people out there that do like it and if you're one of them please let me know down below i'd love to hear what you like about this movie i'm not gonna argue with you I, i'd love to, i just love hearing other people's opinions um if people want to tell me i told you so down in the comments that's fine too like you did my foot's in my mouth i was trying I, I mean i wasn't even trying to be optimistic i liked some of the stuff i saw so it was easy to be optimistic but, it, but there were some things I was still critical of and things I was worried about. And I honestly probably should have went with my gut um, and set my expectations lower when I went into this movie because that made me, maybe I wouldn't have disliked it as much. I don't hate this movie because I don't think there's enough here to hate. But it's certainly there's not even enough here to make it middle of the road. Most of the time when I rate things, I give it like a 5 out of 10 or, you know, 6 out of 10 or somewhere around there, like a, literally in the middle. But this one, I, I can't. But I think it's because I just wasn't expecting something, you know, to dislike something as much as I dislike the Miljovich movies. I was blown away by that. This had all the right elements, that I felt. Um, but it definitely had the wrong filmmaker. Definitely. So if they, if anyone tries to reboot, I, mean, I don't know, maybe don't. Like, after seeing Mortal Kombat this year and how bad that was and how bad Uncharted looks... And how bad the new, the latest Tomb Raider was, which I'm a big fan of that franchise. And I like the person they cast as Tomb Raider, but that movie was not good either. That Laura Croft movie. Maybe, may, and Assassin's Creed wasn't good. Like, maybe we are fooling ourselves uh, with, with getting a good video game adaptation. Um, is it possible? Sure, I guess maybe in the right hands, but I don't think we're going to find the right hands. Maybe we need TV shows. You know, hopefully Halo works as a TV show. Um, hopefully Resident Evil one day can be a, a TV show. I don't know, maybe the Wesker show. I don't know. We'll see. I'll definitely watch that and review it at some point, I'm sure. But we need something. Like, so with something needs to change. Uh, certainly Davis Films, the producer of this, they, no, get rid of them. Con Constantine Films, who own the movie rights to Resident Evil, God, I hope that contract lapses. I hope they have nothing really else. I've seen their uh, their um, Instagram page. They really don't have anything else going for them. They do indie films and stuff, which is great. But keep doing indie films. Give Resident Evil up. You guys cannot make a good Resident Evil movie. I'm sorry, you cannot. Um, you are incapable of producing and finding the right talent to make these movies. Um, the last movies were at least financial successes. We'll see if this one is. It has a $40 million budget, so it has a good chance of making its money back and even making a profit. So it might do that just based off the name and by all the false hopes we got from the interviews and stuff. And the people out there who were like me that were optimistic, that were like, hey, you know what? It doesn't look worse than the previous movies, so maybe there, as long as it's not worse than them, you know, it's, it's a step in the right direction. But I don't feel like this is a step in the right direction at all. Um, 
This is the inverse of the Miljovic. The Miljovic movies is an extreme this way, and these are an extreme that way. And we need something here. We need something right here. And hopefully they find the right people for that one day. But I don't think Con Con Constantine Films is able to do that. So I hope whatever happens with this franchise, one, I hope this movie doesn't get a sequel. Um, and two, I hope we don't get any more Resident Evil things from Constantine Films. And, and, and I know that sounds mean, and I know everyone works really hard to bring these things to life. I'm not trying to cut down your efforts. Um, I appreciate that you worked hard on something that I love and a lot of people love so much to translate it to screen. And I know you all did your best, but at the end of the day, like um, Joel Schumacher, rest in peace, what he always said when he made Batman and Robin. If you dislike a movie, it's the director's fault. If you love a movie, it's everyone's fault because it's a collaboration. He goes, but if you hate the movie, it's the director's fault. I love that he always fell on that sword when it came to Batman and Robin. He's like, hey, look, this is what I was going for. This is what I wanted. And the studio kind of agreed with me and they let me do my thing. And that's how you got Batman and Robin. He goes, but if you don't like it, I take the full blame. That's what Joel Schumacher would say. In this case, Johannes Roberts, if this movie is not liked by others, I haven't, I'll, I'm going to go watch other reviews now. So who knows? Maybe I'm alone and I, I, maybe I'm one of the few people that don't like it this much. But if it's widely disliked by fans and critics, um, then I hope Johannes Roberts comes out and takes the blame for it because uh, it's your name as writer and director. And, uh, and so I, you are at the helm, as Joel Schumacher would say. And I had a lot of respect for, jo for Joel Schumacher because he made some of my favorite movies. He definitely made a terrible Batman movie, two of them, because I don't like Batman Forever either. But, um, but he made some good stuff out there too, like Lost Boys and 8mm um, and Phone Booth and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. Maybe we'll see if Johannes Roberts takes the blame for this if people don't like it. But if you liked it or didn't like it, whatever it is, let me know down below. I've talked long enough and ranted long enough. Um, but I just, I forgot, I have a lot to say. And there's still more to say. I just, I don't want to. I don't want to put any more effort into talking about this movie. And if I forget it, um, I'm going to leave a note for myself um, that I saw this movie and that I recorded my reviews so that I know to edit them and post them up. But I try to get all these in one take, so I'll just throw them up. But I'm going to leave notes for myself because I know I'm, I might forget. I always can forget, um, you know, when I wake up or halfway through the day, like my memory lapses and I don't know where I am and I have these, you know, moments. I'm going to leave a note that says, don't go see this again um, and watch your reviews, <laughs> which I normally don't like to do. I hate hearing myself talk. So uh, so hopefully, and I guess if you made it this far, you, you don't hate hearing me talk. But uh, But thank you. So thank you for not hating me. Uh, but let me know what you th your thoughts are. This is like the fifth time I said that, but um, I'm going to end this now because we've been, I've been going for 50 minutes and it's midnight and I got to go to bed. <laughs> so uh, I'll get this up uh, probably over the weekend. Um, hopefully my, uh, obviously my non-spoiler review already went up um, and, uh, and I look forward to reading all the comments and maybe we'll end this show at episode 100. I was planning on doing it anyway with my health and everything and with this movie being as bad as it is and no new Resident Evil games look like coming out anytime soon, it doesn't make sense to continue this show right now, so uh, so maybe I'll just use this time to take a break. And so maybe episode 99 and 100, I'll just read your comments and respond to them or something like that since I can't do live streams on this channel. So uh, comment down below. Tell me your positives, negatives, you know, what you think about me, what you, you know, what you think about the movie, whatever it is, comment down below and I'll, I'll try to make a separate video where I read your comments and respond to them. So thank you so much. See you in the future. Peace. Thank you.